Well, good morning to all of you, and welcome to worship at St. Mark Presbyterian Church on uh, this first Sunday of Lent. We're delighted that you're with us today, and pray that it is a, a warm and enriching worship service for you. I want us to all be called to worship uh, with these words that, that we're called to, to offer to God our highest and best, and that is our, the worship of God with our heart and mind, with our souls, with all that we are and all that we have. And so let us not only prepare to worship, but actually worship. The words of scripture call us to confession this day, uh, the words from the book of Hebrew, which says, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely so we can get on with our lives. And so as we begin our Lenten journey, let us join our hearts and our minds in unison confession and then in a time of silent confession. Let us pray. Save us, O God, from our default to more of the same if what that means is fretting and worrying, revisiting old wounds and rehearsed excuses. Save us for what is yet to be of your gifts and glory manifest in our lives. Grant us the freedom of truth in our inner beings and the buoyancy of hope in our deepest hearts. For we truly want to be and live better, to see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly every day of this Lenten journey with Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Here now are silent confessions.
if scripture calls us to confess, it also rushes to assure us that God has heard our confessions and that God can forgive and does forgive our sins and cleanse us, it says, from every kind of wrong so that we can begin again. My friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are indeed forgiven. All thanks be to God. And now as those who are forgiven and set free to begin again, let us receive fully the peace of Christ and then let that peace be part of our lives, extend it to one another, extend it to either people with you worshiping now online or just to friends or to family or to strangers that you meet along the way. We are to be givers of peace, not just receivers of peace. Now just imagine a cold night, and as in scripture, Jesus was covered in God's love. And God's love can act as a warm blanket covering and protecting you. Today comes from Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. As we come to the reading and hearing of God's holy word, let us pray together. Gracious God, we ask that you silence all voices but your own so that we might not only 
hear a, a word that has been written long ago, but here it is a living, transformative word in our lives today. For we make this our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The first scripture reading is from the Psalter, from Psalm 25, beginning at verse 1. Listen now for the word of God to you. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O God, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right, and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. And the second reading comes from the gospel according to Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. Continue to listen for God's word to you. In those days, Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. Well, nearly every morning I'm greeted by breaking news. Not just any news, breaking news. I used to think that that meant urgent, important news, something that an involved, well-functioning person like, like I like to think I was would need to know before they even got their coffee. But of course, it didn't take very long before I realized that breaking just meant latest best attention getting or best attention keeping news. So every morning, one of my tasks now after getting coffee has become to decide the value of breaking news for my life and for the lives of others. Was it even worth reading, I wondered, all the while knowing that sometimes you have to read it to know if it's worth reading. Breaking news is meant to get attention, and if ever there was a breaking news gospel, it is the gospel according to Mark. Mark opens with what seems like an enlarged headline, or maybe even a banner. These are the words, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, period. It seems not to need a period, but an ellipsis, as if to say, come on, keep on reading. It's almost as if Mark didn't have enough time to even complete his thought before he dashed off that opening phrase. He didn't have time to introduce his news, to, to draw the reader in with artful words or, or cleverly woven stories. No, Mark only had time for just a few words. He's a spare writer, you might say. Well, what we know from those opening words in Mark's gospel is something about a beginning a new age, something fresh, something different. And it's about good news, but not, not just any good news. The good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. His hope, I'm sure, was that you would keep reading. Mark's gospel, as many of you know, is believed to be the first gospel that was written, which might explain why all the other gospel accounts are so much more elaborate. The other writers had more time, if time were needed, to write it differently, to contextualize maybe some of it, 
to lift certain things out, to even add some things that Mark did not tell, you, tell us about Jesus. The next two Gospels that were written were Matthew and, and Luke, and all three of these Gospels formed what biblical scholars have come to call synoptic Gospels, which means they were alike in many ways. They sort of told those, the same stories, although they weren't truly identical. Matthew's Gospel definitely builds on Mark's, but Matthew sought to give Jesus a place in the Jewish faith tradition. He didn't just come from nowhere, even if it was from Nazareth. He wanted us to know that Jesus was important. Well, since there was no Ancestry.com at that time, no county courthouse records, no extensive geological resource like you might find in Salt Lake City, and certainly no DNA testing, Matthew literally took the reader back to who begat whom, making sure the reader knew that Jesus is related to Israel's greatest king, King David, even though he might not seem so royal. And he wanted the reader to know that Jesus' ancestry included the receiver of God's covenantal blessing, the founding father of their faith, Abraham. But for people who love a story, Luke, not Matthew, really did a better job of weaving a story. Luke's gospel began like a letter or like a conversation might begin. He addressed Theophilus, which literally means lover of God. Was it a person or is it all of us? Luke engaged imagination with stirring word pictures that could, could literally pull your heartstrings. Images of angels and of stories of miracles, beginning with the miracle of new births in, a, in heretofore impossible situations, like the birth of a child born to a barren couple in their old age, or the birth of a child born to a virgin. In Luke's gospel, the word impossible found itself shoved aside as, as accounts of miracles and of wonders, of healings and exorcism moved front and center, and new freedom was found for even ordinary outside Sider type people who were included now included in this wonderful magnificent story of Jesus. Luke also wrote significant, a significantly longer account as did Matthew. After all he wasn't just about breaking news. He really did want to draw us in to, to put us by the manger or in that hungry crowd or, or to have us in the shadows of, of the crucifixion or, or walking that road to Emmaus. Not that the other writers didn't tell stories. They had their take, but Luke was the master storyteller. John's account was the most unique of all. He was the last writer to join the team of witnesses, and he brought to his writing an entirely different way of telling the story of Jesus in metaphors and rich imagery, beginning with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In him was light. And that light, light, was the light of all people. John would say, Jesus is the light of the world, the living water, the bread of life, the good shepherd, the resurrection, and the life. Words meant to create a new foundation of understanding as we entered this gospel story. This John's gospel would be a more heady philosophical group to whom he would appeal his account, Jesus, his account of Jesus' ministry started actually differently than did the Synoptic Gospels. They, they all started with Jesus' baptism, as, as we've heard this morning from Mark, where he was claimed by God, led by the Spirit into the wilderness, tempted by the devil. But in John's Gospel, Jesus' ministry began with a wedding, the wedding at Cana, where he would turn water into wine when the hour was late, and the wine had run out. It was a wonderful story in and of itself. But the story of the wedding at Cana was also something of a metaphor. It declared that the ordinary could become extraordinary because of this man, Jesus, his very word, his very touch, his very presence. It would become potent, even intoxicating, and it would become a celebration always of a new union, but not Mark. None of all these extra words for him, as lovely as they are, not Mark. 
just breaking news. In fact, the one word that runs like a continuous thread through Mark's gospel is the word immediately. So many things were immediate to Mark, so much so that you can almost hear the staccato rhythm undergirding every plain word he wrote. And that's how the story opens that we read today on this first Sunday of Lent, just the facts. No angels, no dreams, no rich imagery, no fine metaphors. It's just as if a curtain had, had opened and, and we're supposed to jump on this already moving train, a moving train of a forerunner predicted for this Messiah, John the Baptist, his cousin, who was introduced to us in Luke's gospel quite differently. There he was a miracle baby but not here. Here he's a fiery, wild evangelist calling for repentance and promising forgiveness, calling for believers to prepare the way of the Lord, to, to make straight God's path. Sin and salvation were John's mantras, and the visible sign of an inward change would be baptism. This was the context for Jesus, the one into which he walked that day and himself was baptized. The beginning of this new age of salvation would be repentance from old ways and salvation, that is healing, wholeness, forgiveness, as the good news presents to us a new beginning. But baptism is not just about repentance. If we read in scripture, it's also about being claimed by God, named by God, commissioned by God, not just from something, but for something. The Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove, Mark said, and the voice of God declared his identity, but something important is to note is that right after his identity and calling are set forth for the reader, Jesus is, is led and or sometimes even driven into the wilderness, depending on accounts, to be tested or to be tempted by the devil. The temptation story is part of the three synoptic gospels but in the versions of matthew and luke there is much more detail particularly regarding three temptations mark doesn't bother with things like turning the stone into bread in order for jesus to satiate his own hunger or jumping from a pinnacle to be rescued by god or worshiping the tempter in order to have it all now not later all we know from Mark is that Jesus was with the beasts in the wilderness, was tempted by the devil, and was waited on by angels. The rest is up to our imaginations, maybe up to what we might experience as temptation. In fact, maybe Mark did us a favor by leaving those specifics out. out. Maybe my temptation wouldn't be the same as yours and, and vice versa. What we can glean from Mark is that our stories, our stories of our identity and, and calling might have parallels with Jesus. Not the same identity or calling, and obviously not the same temptations. We have unique identity, unique calling, and maybe even unique temptation. And we need to know what all these three things are, who we are, what we're called to do, and what trips us up. What was common in all the versions of this temptation story was the setting. It is called a wilderness. That's the place of temptation. That's often true about where we tend to be tempted. It, tempted. it doesn't have to be a, a literal wilderness. Any place will work when things aren't clear, when there's not a, an obvious choice or the way is not obvious, where the pieces don't add up when we feel lost and, and maybe confused, as, as one writer said, when we feel bewildered. It can be a place where we can count too much upon our own strengths, and that sometimes brings us down. Sometimes confidence makes us so cocky that vulnerability enters in. When we're not so confident or so strong or, or so sure of ourselves, we, we tend to sometimes be more alert. Confidence can make us maybe an easy target. Another reason or way in which we can be tempted is to refuse to, to rise to the occasion when we don't think we're good enough or our weakness or, 
are, are too, too large or we have no experience or, or sometimes detachment keeps us from becoming involved. Sometimes previous failures give us an excuse not to act. Well, whether it's arrogance or self-doubt or indifference, the wilderness is the place of temptation where it can happen because we're off balance and unexpected things can trip us up. So, breaking news. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. With that, Mark draws us in on this first Sunday of Lent. Lent is the season that calls us to consider our lives, our own identities, our own callings, which can often change, and our own temptations, and to do so in the context of God's saving love in Jesus Christ. We matter, and what we do matters in God's purposes. For instance, as a Lenten discipline, in reading Jesus' temptation, we might wonder who or what tempts us, who or what helps us like the angels had waited on Jesus. We might consider what beasts are with us, what strange companions, you might say. One thing always to ask is where are the beasts and angels in Jesus' story? Were they, were they part of him? Was it an, an internal struggle that he had? Were they other than him, an external struggle, some of both? These are the questions we can ask on this first Sunday of Lent. What happened to Jesus, of course, also happens to us. Internal struggles, external struggles. Mark tells us that somehow Jesus left that wilderness. He doesn't say when or how. And then he says he proclaims that the time is fulfilled, the hour is upon them, the kingdom of God comes near. This message demands a response. Repent, turn around, believe the good news. Those are the words, which begs the question, from what do we need to repent, to, to turn around? What does the kingdom look like, maybe, to us, this kingdom of God near? Have we built other kingdoms or moved into them? Is this news of Jesus good for us? And how, in a practical way, do we need that good news? These words from Mark were, were one of those lectionary passages for today. Those are readings that are shared across Christendom, lots of churches, uh, in lots of churches these are the scripture readings for today. Also, along with that, are the words from Psalm 25, which is one of the great ones to consider during Lent because the psalmist prays that God will direct his paths. There it is again. Prepare the way of the Lord. These are God's highways. What are they? Are we on them? What, what kind of detours have we found ourselves taking? A good reading of Scripture is always to enter the story to not stand as a detached observer seeking to glean information that might be helpful someday. Rather, it is to become part of it, to let it speak to us, not just information, but maybe revelation. Some have said, we don't just read scripture, scripture reads us. So beasts and angels, a bewildering place, a tempter with a name and all of us with a calling and the power to choose. That's where we are this first Sunday of Lent. We're here with Jesus in this breaking story. Will we really read it? Will we let it wash over us or at least draw us in? That's the question. The funny thing is, it is breaking news, but it's never old news, never resolved news, because the kingdom is near, but not fully here. Maybe its final realization is just waiting for more of us to wake up, to wake up on all levels to our need, to see the emptiness of the kingdoms that we choose to live in, and to want to respond 
to this ever-breaking good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, the one who came for us. All thanks be to God. Amen. Information of faith today comes from a declaration of faith, and I invite you to join me in affirming the faith of the church. God created all the worlds that are and upholds and rules everything. We affirm that the universe exists by the power of God's word and spirit. God has chosen to give it reality out of the love we've come to know in Christ. God still works through the processes that shape and change the earth and the living things upon it. We acknowledge God's care and control in the regularity of the universe as well as in apparently random things. There is no event from which God is absent and his ultimate purpose in all events is just and loving. That purpose embraces our choices and will surely be accomplished. The creator works in all things toward the new creation that is promised in Christ. Today, as we gather as a family of faith, even remotely, we have much going on in our congregational life that I want to remind you of. There are ongoing groups that you can join, and so read about those in happenings or check uh, with the church office. Lenten devotionals are available for you, both online or you can have a hard copy. Those, the hard copies are available in the church office, or they can be brought to you if you would like one uh, delivered to your house. I want to um, always remind you to, uh, that we, we often at this time in our service uh, invite people to bring their gifts, their tithes and their offerings, and so don't forget to do that. We're Though we're meeting remotely, the church's work uh, continues to go on. It's, it's worship and it's many, many ministries. Today I'm excited to tell you about new life and the families of our congregation. You'll see we have uh, two roses. We have many roses here, but we have two roses on the piano. 
uh, re representing births in two families, uh, families here at our, uh, at our church here at St. Mark. From the, in, the McCarthy, in the McCarthy and Merritt families was, was born this week, Olivia Marie McCarthy to, uh, Mark, uh, to, to, ja to James and to Maggie. And into the Klein family uh, was born Alice, Michelle, Klein, and we're just de delighted to uh, celebrate with them. We have, of course, uh, sets of grandparents here. They're very active, the Merritts and the Kleins, and so we rejoice at new life that goes on in these families and in our church family. And now let us come to God in a time of prayer. Gracious God, you are the one whose saving love guides and protects us as we journey through our lives the one who calls us to worship you and to remember again that you are our origin and our destiny. As the psalmist wrote, you hold our lot. You show us the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. We need that assurance, O oh God, because sometimes life can be burdensome and fearful, lonely, even painful. Help us as we move through this Lenten season to do so with less censored hearts, with open and waiting minds, with courage to seek the truth. Remind us that happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Grant us, O God, the grace to tell the truth about our lives, the truth about our needs, the truth about our weaknesses, the truth about brokenness and our failures and sins. Meet us, O oh God, with your forgiving, healing spirit. Accept our gratitude, O oh God, this day for those who love us, for those with whom we share our lives and our work, for the times that we are free of so much self-absorption for all those small gifts that mean so much that we find in ordinary places. Oh God, as those blessed, we ask you to help us be truly a blessing to others. For we know that we do not live for ourselves alone and that we need each other. We're part of your body, your kingdom on earth, as it will be in heaven. Hear now, oh God, our prayers for those that we know to be most in need this day. For we bring to them to you as those bringing someone for help. And so we ask that in the silence of our time here together, you hear our prayers. Hear our prayers, O oh God, now for our families and for this, our church family. Hear our prayers for our community and for our country and for this, your world. And finally, oh God, hear our prayers for ourselves. We bring to you these, O oh God, these prayers, all our prayers, and we do so through Jesus who came and who brought good news. Jesus who taught disciples to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion, the, the fellowship, the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with you on your Lenten journey this week and always. <laughs>